Hi everyone, welcome to the IPFS Core Implementations Weekly Sync for Monday the 20th of April. I am Aiken Brain, I will be your host as we go through all of the exciting high priority initiatives uh, that everyone's been working on this week. So, uh, the first one is uh, upcoming and shipped releases. So I can do a quick chat about uh, JSRFS. So we uh, shipped uh, 0.43, which was ordinarily it would have been a point release, but um, because we switched to a post-only API, uh, it became a minor. Um, obviously, uh, GoIPFS 0.5 is dropping imminently, which brings uh, a whole bunch of bit swap improvements. So um, Dirt has done an amazing job of porting those to JSRFS. Uh, and they are in the release canon, ready to go. Um, so as soon as go uh, Professor point five drops, we will ship those uh, in a coordinated fashion and for much great speedy uh, content which will benefit, which will be super exciting. Um, can anyone talk to uh, go up your first point five? Yes. Uh, it is in the works. We are looking to launch that on Tuesday. Um, so we are just doing a bunch of preparation for that. Um, lots of testing and yeah, and release prep and release announcements and migration notes and all of that good stuff is in the works this week. So we're working on getting that out for Tuesday. Next Tuesday, not tomorrow. Super exciting. Um, so the next, uh, the next high priority initiative is content routing. You can tell us what's going on in the world of content routing. Yeah, for that, uh, as I mentioned, O.5, so we're prepping for that. Um, and then we are also formally kicking off the work for O.6 tomorrow. And so we'll start working on that. Any patches for 0.5 will definitely take priority, um, but we're gonna start working on that. Um, and uh, we'll start rolling with our six week release cycle. So we can start uh, working. That's what we're gonna be working towards is six week releases. And then we'll just be cutting stuff so that people get the things sooner. And uh, yeah, so there's a Zen Hub board. I'll be updating that. There's a couple quick fixes for there and some consolidation of efforts that we're gonna do, um, but that is the uh, the gist there. And then we'll create an uh, O.6 release issue as well in Go IPFS, and then do kind of an overview there of uh, the things to come. I'm looking forward to that. That's gonna be amazing. Uh, can anybody tell us what's going on with the Hydra? Yeah, I can take that. <laughs> uh, so Hydra Boost is now, uh, this, sorry, it's been a while since I've been here, so I'm just sort of putting everything I know hasn't been announced yet in, in here. But uh, the Hydra Boost is now proactively find providers it's asked about. So being a DHT participant, it gets asked like, who who, who has this all the time? And so, uh, so what it does is it, if it doesn't know the answer, then it goes and looks it up and installs it so that next time it's asked, it knows. So that's super cool. Uh, the dependencies have been updated to the latest libp2p and uh, the CAD DHT module, so we're running stuff that is going to be in the 0.5 uh, release. Um, the peer IDs, so Hydras have many, 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 many heads. Uh, Peter uh, added uh, balanced peer IDs, so when we generate what what it does is it generates peer IDs randomly. Uh, but what we don't want to happen is when that, that generation happens for those peer IDs to end up like next to each other in the same bucket sort of thing. So they're actually generated so that they're balanced in, in the tree. Um, and uh, that's great, but it was only happening per Hydra and we run multiple Hydras because of the limitations of machines. You can only run like say, you know, 200 or so heads per Hydra before things start like falling over. Uh, so balancing them on one Hydra is great, but uh, you could have overlap in other Hydras. So now what we've done is we have one Hydra ID gen server and the other Hydras in the Hydra swarm uh, ask that ID gen server to generate it a, a peer ID. So all of the peer IDs that are uh, generated are balanced across all Hydras. So, uh, so that is good news. Um, other stuff is um, the whole 
a big part of Hydra is that there's a big belly uh, where all of the data is stored, all of the provider records, and all of the Hydra heads share that data. Um, and, and that's good, again, per Hydra, but if we've got multiple Hydras, then like we might be asked for something, one Hydra might be asked for something that is in another Hydra belly so what we want is a belly one belly to rule all the hydras uh that's just kind of weird um <laughs> i don't know why i said that but you know what i mean um so what we'd ideally have is like a one store uh with all of the data in it that all of the hydras can um can can uh, get data from um, and we've been working on getting the there's a old sql data store for go ipfs that jeremy created a long time ago that um, I've been fixing up, it now passes all the Go's data store uh, tests and it now streams results instead of um, buffering them all into memory, so that's good. Uh, I then tried to use it and then ran into a number of other problems like seg faults and uh, deadlocks, so I'm currently working through, um, through solving that, but once that's done, we'll have a persistent data store that is shared by all Hydras, so that's super good news. The final thing that happened was that we moved, we were hosting it on Google Cloud, but it turns out sending data across the internet uh, is, costs a lot of money uh, in Google Cloud. Um, who knew? Uh, we changed, so we changed as we moved them to DigitalOcean um, and that's made a whole lot easier now because all of the Kubernetes uh, configs are saved in the repo uh, so that we can just put it here, put it somewhere else. We don't like DigitalOcean, put it wherever, you know. Um, we can do that um, quite easily now. So that's good. Um, next up for Hydra is uh, we need to get that uh, Postgres SQL data store working. Oh, one thing I didn't put down here that I've been working on is like all of the Hydra heads are trying to GC that shared data store because provider records don't last forever. They last for like 24 hours and then they get GC'd. Uh, but all of like 200 heads of a Hydra are trying to GC the same data store and ideally we don't want that. Uh, so I'm, I'm just working out how to do, uh, just get one of the heads to do garbage collection on that repo. Um, so then, yeah, need, need to get a rollout plan for, um, for rolling out Hydra with um, 0.5, what needs to happen there. Um, and um, next up, I wanted to improve the metrics for finding providers. You can see a picture there of what we now have. We're able to know like how long it's taking us to find um, provider records in the network. Like look, so we can look at like stuff that we already have, stuff that we found in the network, stuff that we don't have, and isn't found in the network. Um, and then um, the other like orange one that you can see in that screenshot is like, we get asked the same time for the same CID, like who has this CID, like lots of times. So we like we discard some requests for content. So we're doing a lot of discarding, um, but our, like um, I need to, we need to figure out a little bit more why, why we're having to do that and, and what can be done about it. Uh, so we've got some good metrics, they need to be improved. And then lastly, to finish this massive long ramble, I apologize, um, I just want to do a little bit of uh, visualizing Hydra boosters on the network um, and validating their effectiveness um, uh, and just having something to show that. That's Hydra, hooray! <laughs> Hail Hydra, indeed. Nice work. So cool. Moving on. Uh, next up is the subdomain gateway. Uh, Lido, can you tell us what's going on there? Uh, yep. Uh, not much. <laughs> uh, mostly, uh, mostly fixes. Uh, one other important fix was to redirect directories. Uh, so when you set up a subdomain gateway, uh, that subdomain gateway will still accept requests for the old school paths. So if you ask subdomain gateway for uh, slash IPFS something, uh, it will return a redirect to the proper resource on the subdomain. Uh, and we did that for files. The problem was uh, the directory listings were created by a different code path and that was not redirected. Uh, so it stayed until you clicked on a file and that file, and then you got redirected to subdomain. So now we, we fixed that and everything from the get-go gets redirected to subdomain. Uh, 
it was like it was not really a security problem because we control how direct the HTML responsible for directory listings. However, like it looked weird. Uh, so that's fixed. I'm not sure if it's in RC2 or it will be in the next one. Uh, but so but that's the main uh, fix and something that already landed but i did not mention before and probably uh like we sneaked that into go ipfs 0.5 but i don't believe it was described anywhere outside of the pr and i realized i did not even close the issue about supporting IP, uh, case insensitive uh, uh, ipns identifiers so just for a quick illustration maybe um can you see my screen? Yes. Oh, cool. Uh, uh, all right. So uh, I'll make it super brief. Um, it's part, uh, like, very important part of the CIDV1 migration was uh, supporting case insensitive uh, IPNS names. And now we support that both in the gateway and also in the command line. So in the command line, uh, when you like, resolve the old school identifier, this is base 58, it's case sensitive. Um, it can point at arbitrary content paths. However, we are not able to put that in subdomain. So we support uh, representing peer IDs as CID v1. Uh, so we can put them in subdomains. The problem is uh, it's, it's using a different multicodec. So we like, it's like self-describing that it's not a content, uh, like it's not an identifier from regular IPFS uh, path. It's representing lippy to picky. So what happens when you use uh, CIDV1 with different multicodec? In this case, it's DACDB which you will get when you convert this old school thing to the new thing using the standard command. Uh, we will, you will get this useful error that, hey, this peer ID is represented as CIDV1, but it has a wrong multicodec. And in the same message, we already did the proper conversion and it's ready for you. So if you retry with that one, uh, you will properly resolve IPNS name. And you can see, like you can probably won't see this, but the only difference is here, this is DACPB, and here it's lippy to picky But I think it's very useful thing to know that we handle this. On the command line, there's this useful uh, error message. And on the gateway, you don't even notice because when we redirect, when we uh, redirect to a subdomain, the multicodec is automatically fixed up. Um, so I think it's useful to know that it's, uh, it's there. You can use not only IPFS in subdomains, but also IPNS identifiers. And next would be uh, adding support for subdomains to JS IPFS, but it's like I have got other uh, stuff on my plate. And we'll get to that eventually, I uh, promise, because I want to have uh, interrupt test suite, like add a gateway interrupt test suite, which uh, other other folks, other implementations who want to provide a gateway functionality can run against. Um, yeah, Alan. We have a, a CID command line tool um, for changing CIDs into base thirty two. Just wondering if um, if there was any plans or if, or if you think there's any need for like a a tool that will convert your peer ID into the base 32 version with a with the lippy to p key rather than just a DAG PB codec. Yeah, so like the problem is when you pass the CID to that command, like IPFS CID base 32, right? When you pass a CID, there's no way to tell if if it's like DAG PB, is that an error or is that what I really want? you would have to pass the full path, like slash IPNS and then CID. But that's like something most of people want to do. They just copy just the CID. So that's why we provide this useful error message. So it 
it's not a big blocker, but people immediately learn that, oh, there's this multi-codec. If I want to do this more often, I need to account that in my workflow. There's also a, a, in the IPFS CID command itself, you can uh, print uh, CIDV0 as CIDV1 and manually specify the multi-codec. So I, that's already in the command. Like it will are already, already shipping that. So I don't think anything else is needed. Gotcha. We'll see. Okay. So I guess my, yeah. the, my follow up question is like, when do, when do peer IDs become base 32 libp2p keys by default? Like when you create a new IPFS node, is that ever going to happen? Yeah. So I think that's a decision we need to make around the, the moment we flip the switch for the IPFS, right? So if we change the output of uh, all the command line tools to base32, we may do the, the same for peer IDs just for the sake of like having uniform representation of everywhere. Mm, but that's like probably for the 0.6 or further. Okay, thank you. Cool, the next uh, initiative on the list is bits for updates. Dirt. Oh, stop my video. Uh, yeah, so there was just a couple of, um, couple of issues we're clearing up as we're pushing towards the 0 0.5 release. Uh, so one of those was we had a, a race in the way that we were handling uh, requests for once and cancels, so that's fixed now. And then we were also, um, there was a related problem with how we were managing managing uh, connection. So we've just kind of done a refactor to move that into the networking layer. So it simplifies the rest of the code. So hopefully uh, I've got a little bit more work to do on connection management. Hopefully that'll be finished by today. Uh, stream content. Uh, oh, the whole thing's moved. Oh, talking, is it? Hi, John. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so um, I am uh, burning down things to uh, version one point uh, zero point one. Um, the last piece remaining was uh, to put together the ability to. Uh, run multiple chunkers at the same time one after the other without penalizing anything so uh the sub chunking runs in other go routines but because uh we're dealing with a stream all of this has to be reassembled correctly in order after that and it took a very arduous rewrite of how all of this is being put together which is actually done it has been done since like uh late yesterday Unfortunately, I have a failing test that only fails under Go test. It works perfectly on, um, like if I if I run the very same thing with on the command line and the command line just just does everything the way I expect. But the moment you go Go test for tests that I had written before, it blows up with actual uh, memory corruption errors and stuff like that. So I am uh, tracking this down uh, as fast as I can. Um, Unfortunately, none of the Go race tools or anything like this are useful because the moment you slow down your execution, everything goes away. It's a problem. So I'm basically listening to the code and commenting uh, section after section until I find it. And uh, I am actually at a spot where I would uh, want a couple of, well, whoever is interested, uh, to uh, attend basically a kind of like a a UX review session to before we open it up to the to the wider community. Uh, I am hoping to schedule this for tomorrow. Uh, please leave uh, a note in the uh, in the crypto pad uh, if you want to attend, and I'll figure out how to uh, how to schedule this around. Uh, it will be like half an hour, uh, just showing you what what it does, a little bit of background, why we are where we are, 
and uh, then any input on you know on what is weird or what is awesome and that's that. So I have. Create a design review section for people to sign up. Uh, sorry, work up. Can you say this again? Sorry, I've created a design review section for people to sign up. Uh, cool. Uh, we are running out of time. So, moving on, uh, the Rust IPFS initiative. Yeah, um, I will be fairly quick. Uh, we finished grant phase one. And if you look in the crypt pad, you can see the full roster of HTTP API endpoints that we support now, in addition to just the underlying Rust APIs that perform all the functionality. Um, and we also got uh, the IPFS name on crates.io, so soon you'll be able to include that in your Rust project or cargo install IPFS, which is pretty neat. Um, we want to, you know, we're, our intent is to apply for another uh, grant round to get more functionality in and move towards un basic Unix FS and um, gateway functionality as well. With the idea that we can like launch the first Rust gateway or something. Uh, cool little note is that uh, Jonas from the team figured out a way to have the compile time, uh, which was becoming pretty long, so that was cool. And then for requests, I just have the list in the crypt pad of the JS IPFS pull requests that need, I guess, attention or whatever. That's all from us. Well, I will get to those PRs. Um, something I've done uh, in order to, well, sort of have to help you guys out and also help us out as well, is we've had a refactor on the cards for the UnixFS importer for a while because um, it currently uses the internal uh, IPLD instance of JS IPFS. Uh, and I've refactored it to only use the block API, like the public block API. Um, that's awesome. That's that's super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So you should be able to use that to experiment with all kinds of weird esoteric DAG structures yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, cool. And it helps us too because we used to double uh, serialize blocks because uh, of a quirk of how IPLD is structured, and that doesn't happen anymore. So it's a little bit faster, <laughs> and I can play with it too. Awesome. Uh, I'm just waiting for a review on that before I can release it. Well, we really appreciate the effort, so thank you. Awesome. Yeah, it's really, really exciting to see IPFS in another language. Yeah, it's exciting for us too. Cool. So, moving on, uh, the peer store improvements in JS Hey, everyone. So, in uh, peer store improvements, uh, well, milestone one with the address book and proto book is now closed. All PRs were merged in the JS 0 0.28 release branch, which is cool. Uh, the second milestone with the, the peer info removal from all the code base and API uh, is in a good shape now. Uh, all the needed PRs are ready. Jacob already reviewed and merged the PRs for the interface. So the other, the other ones will uh, go for review now. Uh, also, since we are removing uh, uh, peer info, basically in JSLPTP and JSIPFS, we were using peer info to provide the listen addresses. So as we removed the peer info, uh, I'm also working on a, an address manager component uh, where we will be able to provide to the LPTP configuration uh, announce, no announce in listen addresses, which was the thing that we wanted to support for a while, but has been in the backlog. And finally, this week, I will start also working on the implementation of the milestone tree, which will include the peer store persistence for the address book and the proto book. Uh, and then in the future, the milestone four will integrate the key book with the persistence also for the, the keys. And that's it. Cool. Um, so I did a section on cancelable requests in JSIPFS. Um, so I'm working on this at the moment. We've got uh, PRs at the moment. Um, well, so that it's been merged into the importer IPLD in the block service, and that's basically just passing. So we're using a like so GoIPFS has this idea of a contact. And the context has a deadline and it can expire, etc. Um, and so we have in JSLAM, we have uh, abort controllers which have abort signals. And you can listen to an abort signal, and that abort signal will fire after a timeout or if the user manually uh, aborts it or if it's over HTTP and the connection gets severed. Um, and so, not every like, and so what the first kind of round is to basically pull, pass that abort signal into every single API request. Um, 
not every API request will respond to it because some are synchronous, uh, some just don't have anything to cancel. Um, the ones that the, the first two that I want to get to cancel is if you're requesting a CID that you don't have in your repo, so it gets added to the bit swap want list. Um, and if you cancel that request, it should vanish from the bit swap want list. That's the first thing. The other thing is uh, libp to p So if you're opening connections to uh, other nodes and the request gets cancelled, those connections should be torn down. Um, once those are those two things happen, and you're going to call it the first run done and ship it. Um, and that will be super exciting. We'll have cancelable requests, which will make Microsoft very happy. Um, any questions? I have one. Um, hearing your explanation, I'm not sure if by like, turning all the connections that were already open is a good strategy, just because it will lead to a lot of churn. You probably want to cancel all of the asks to open for more connections. Um, so anything that is on the queue to like dial, just like cancel those, but like all the ones that you have already opened that are already part of the routing table or the JVAC change already like other protocols, just like keep them around because it's not that you have like, it might be the case that you had to close previous connections to open those, uh, right? And so if now you close the new ones, then you will run out of connections. Like you can just like keep the new ones and I just call it like the new state. This is like my, my observation. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe like there is an analysis that proposes it otherwise. Yeah, I mean, it's worth looking into like what's actually achievable. Because like the, the concern is that if you have someone. Sorry, say again? I said it's worth looking into, yeah, what's achievable and what isn't and what the best strategy would be. Because the concern is like if you have somebody hammering the, the API with a bunch of nonsense requests that cause all these things to happen, you can put some rate limiting in front of it and you might want to cancel some of those requests that have come in already and you put that limit. Yeah, yeah, totally agree with canceling a bunch of the things like taking it out of the want list, like rate limiting the API requests. It's just like if opening a connection is such a, an expensive thing that you don't want now to just like close the ones that you already have open. Like, like let the connection manager decide that. That's what I'm saying. I'm check. We are at time. Cool. We are at time. Uh, if anyone wants to drop off, drop off. Um, otherwise, we'll go through the uh, low priority initiative and all the other lists. Um, so the other initiatives: Unix V1.5. Uh, nothing for me on that. Uh, Peter. Cool. Uh, add performance. So I had a little. Um, one of the problems that we have is that the uh, streaming, right? So JSR reverse got really fast when we started uh, parallelizing the ingestion of blocks. Um, and so we can like hash them all in parallel and write them to disk in parallel. It got way, way faster than it used to be. Uh, but what the place that doesn't work is over HTTP because you can only fundamentally read one block at a time uh, before you send the first result. Like you have to read all of the blocks before you can send any results because HTTP is a request and a response. You can't have bi-directional communication um, with HTTP unless you use WebSockets and all that kind of stuff, which we don't do, we just use HTTP. Um, so I had this idea of like, what if you could just uh, do all that parallelization on the client and send loads of requests in parallel to the server? So this partly tied into the uh, refactoring of the Unix FS importer uh, to use the block API because suddenly you can do all the chunking on the client and call the block API loads of times from the client, which in theory will be a lot faster. Turns out it's actually slower, um, which was tedious. So yeah, that was a dead end. But that was mine. Uh, HTTP does support bidirectional streaming. Not all HTTP servers are client supported. HTTP supports it. Um, yeah, so if this is this is a problem with JavaScript with the browser, the browser doesn't do this, or what happened? I mean, can look into it. This is how we do everything in Go. Where like uh, you 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 send all your data streaming, and then you receive the data streaming, mm -hmm. and then the Go HD server does not like this actually, but it's fine. We work around it. Cool. Well, I'll look into it. Uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, so, uh, ED25519 key interrupt. Yeah, starting work on that this week. Going to make sure that 
uh, JS libp2p, go libp2p, JS IPFS, and go IPFS are all interoperable with those keys uh, before the IPFS 0.6 release, which is in like four ish weeks. Cool. Uh, migration to multi hash keys in block store, no hector. Anybody else give an update on that? It, it's already. Um, we just have one design review meeting that we need to hold, but we've been holding off on the design review meeting to finish up the release. Um, we should probably schedule that for next week. But we have a bunch of people listed who want to attend, so we'll just schedule it later. Yeah, please do um, put me on that list. I think you're on that list. Yes. Uh, design review proposals. It says a review for the UX design for Dagger. Um, if you're interested, stick your uh, handle in that list and the meeting will be set up and you will be notified. Uh, any blockers or asks? Any questions? Anything for the parking lot? Hooray! That's it then. Okay, uh, you're all set free. This has been the uh, Core Implementations Weekly Sync for Monday the 20th of April. Uh, amazing stuff. Well done everyone. Don't touch your face. Be safe. Bye.